So I used to teach the DSM to graduate students as an advocate because I believed the advertising from the American Psychiatric Association, which is the lobby group that publishes the DSM. And I believed what they said when they said that it was scientifically based. So I remember saying to my graduate students, I remember holding up this three pound tome that was the DSM and saying to my graduate students in the 80s, um, isn't it wonderful because the American Psychiatric Association has read all the scientific research. Now one of my areas of specialization is research methods, right? So I thought, I said, isn't it great that somebody, they have read all of the scientific research that's relevant to how to help people who are suffering. And they've culled through it and then this book, the DSM, uh, contains what we've learned from them about how to help people who are suffering. That's what I believed. Then in 1985, I had written a book called The Myth of Women's Masochism. It was saying, when we get beaten, no, it's not because we enjoy it. When we don't get promotions, it's not because we fear success. You know, it's, it's because of sexism. So, so I had written this book, and it was in press. And I got a call from Jean Baker Miller, who wrote the wonderful book, Toward a New Psychology of Women. If you haven't read it, I really urge you to, women and men. It's a fabulous book. It's about power dynamics. Um, uh, for one thing. And so she said, some of, she said, did you hear what's happening with, uh, as we move toward DSM 3R? This was back in 1985. And I said, no. And she said, well, they're proposing two new categories, and they were, they were going to be especially dangerous to women. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail, except to, t and one was masochistic personality disorder. So I just want to tell you this, a couple of things. One is, I was invited by this women's group um, within APA to come to a special meeting. They had protested these categories, and the DSM guys, and it was mostly white American male wealthy psychiatrists who all believed the same things, um, uh, they said, oh, well, we've got to deal with the women. So they created this ad hoc committee to deal with the women. And so I was invited to go to this meeting. Now, I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, and I was raised in a family that said, don't ever be afraid to be wrong. Don't ever be embarrassed to ask questions. So I, I looked at who was going to be on this DSM ad hoc committee to deal with the women. They didn't call it to deal with the women, but it was on the controversial diagnoses. And there I am, 1985, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to go to the APA headquarters. And it looks just like you'd picture it. And I thought, well, I'm going to say my little you know, two or three minute piece about I don't think that women enjoy suffering, and I wish you wouldn't put masochistic personality disorder in the next DSM. This was 3R. And, um, and, and I thought, and then these people who are on this committee who are, God, they're experts, you know. I read their work in graduate school. And so I'm sure that what will happen is I'll speak my piece, and then they'll tell me where I'm wrong, or they'll tell me what I neglected to look at, and I'll learn something, and that'll, that'll be good. That'll be good. It's okay, I'm an actor. I'll speak up until they, I think somebody's coming in. Um, and um, so that's what I expected. So I went there, and I, and I said my piece. I said, look, masochistic personality disorder, it's based on the really stupid assumption that there's such a thing as enjoyment of pain. By definition, that's just a dumb definition. I said, look, there are people who will put up with pain and suffering because there's nothing better available or because they've been abused or traumatized and they don't think there's anything more available for them. But that's very different from actually enjoying the pain. All right, now, the day before, I had been on, remember Donahue, Phil Donahue's show? I had been on Donahue. I was starting a book tour, and I had been speaking about this. So I speak my piece, and I'm, ex I'm expecting the APA people to tell me where I'm wrong. Well, there was this little silence, and then Robert Spitzer, who was the head of DSM-3R, said, just like this, he said, I saw you on Donahue. I, and I was just kind of embarrassed for him, you know, and I didn't know what to say. And, uh, and, then he, and so I didn't say anything, and then he said, I agreed with just about everything you said. And I said, well, since I was saying that I don't think there is such a thing as enjoyment of suffering, uh, I'm not sure why you would be planning on putting this category in the next edition of the DSM. 
And, and he and the other DSM committee people said, oh, because we see people like this all the time. I said, no, what you're seeing are either women who were well socialized to put other people's needs ahead of their own, not because they love it, but because if you're a good woman, that's what you're supposed to do and you get, you get rejected and criticized if you don't put other people's needs first. Or you're seeing victims of trauma or abuse. And you want to say that their reactions are mental illness? Well, I was so shocked by the poor quality of thinking that went on in that room. That was the beginning of my learning about the DSM. And because I want to focus today on what can be done, let me just say I, wrote, I, I, um, I ended up being on two DSM-4 committees, because I think they were trying to co-opt me when Alan Francis became head of DSM-4. Uh, they asked me, he asked me to be on two committees for DSM-4, and I was on them for two years, and then I resigned because I was so horrified when I, now remember, I'm a research methodology specialist, so here's what they do with, with research relevant to people's suffering. If there is well-done research that doesn't fit with what they want to do anyway, they ignore it or they distort it or they, listen to the word, lie about it. Mm -hmm. I use the word lie in a book I wrote about my time with the DSM folks called They Say You're Crazy. I think they have some copies of it here. Um, I, I use the word lie and that book came out in 1995 and nobody has ever breathed a word of suing me for libel because they know. I've got it all documented. Right? <laughs> and um, if there is badly done research, but they can use it to support whatever they want to put in the DSM anyway, then they'll use it and they won't let you know it's junk science. That's in, in a nutshell. And I have all these juicy examples, but I'm not going to indulge myself and tell you them, but I just I love to talk about it. Anyway, um, okay, so. So my, my ex exposure to the DSM people started in 85. Then I was on their two committees, 88 to 90. Um, oh, and going back a step. Now the first thing that I tried to do to stop them and to, to let people know, because most of the public doesn't know how bad it is, and, and it was certainly not in the, in the 80s, was that after this meeting with the, I saw you on Donahue, um, I, uh, I thought, well, people need to know about this and so I went to the next conference of the Association for Women in Psychology which all of you should join women and men both it's fabulous it broke off from the women's division of American Psychological and it's a very social action oriented group they're wonderful so I went to the next meeting and I was telling them about these these diagnoses that had been proposed and and I said, uh, I said, we need to do something about this. And I'm going to start a petition. So let me get an email for each of you. And then I thought, no, people don't follow up. Everybody gets busy. So I just hand wrote a little petition. And I started circulating it there. And then I started sending it out later through email. And that was before email was such a big deal. And to shorten the story, we ended up with signatures from individuals and with letters from huge organizations like the National Organization of Women, like the Canadian Psychological Association, which would never do it now. Everybody gets more conservative. But um, we ended up with representing six million people in this protest against these proposed categories. One of the categories, actually there were three at the beginning, one was paraphilic rapism. Now, they're bringing it back. They're actually considering it for this edition of the DSM. Know what it is? If a person has committed rape or attempted rape or thinks about it a lot, that makes them mentally ill with paraphilic rapism. So what would it mean in court? An automatic mitigating factor, right? Oh, they, you shouldn't give them such a, high, a, 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 a harsh sentence because they're mentally ill. They couldn't help it or send them to a mental hospital rather than prison, which I know in many ways can be worse than, than prison. But anyway, um, at that time in the late 80s, there was an assistant attorney general of the United States who was a woman, and she got wind of this. And she sent a letter to the APA saying, if you put this label in your manual, we will file lawsuits. So they withdrew it. Um, now they're trying to bring it back. So in any case, um, in uh, this petition campaign, 
uh, what, what happened as a result was not very much. Um, there was so much public outcry at that time because of the petition campaign, and we did a lot of media interviews as a result of that, that Robert Spitzer, head of DSM-3R, had to do something. And th these people are very clever. And so watch for them to do this kind of thing with, with the next edition as well. Um, <clears throat> what he did was he announced publicly that because of the protest, he had come up with a compromise solution. And that was, for the first time ever, the DSM was going to have an appendix for categories requiring further study. So they would put masochistic personality disorder, which was renamed self-defeating personality disorder, they would put that high. They would put that and the other category they were still considering, which was uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Women go crazy once a month. Um, they were going to put that in appendix for categor categories requiring further study. Now, what they didn't do was to say in the appendix, for God's sake, don't use these labels for anybody because they have not even been shown to be real entities. They didn't say that. In fact, they have a whatever it is, four or five digit code for each one with the, um, what do you call it, with the decimal point, you know, so that it looks very scientific. And they have all of the, the criteria that they came up with listed there. And so people have used them on patients who come into the system as though they're valid categories, and they have also used them in research. So here we are, we have two categories that have not been shown to represent anything real. And people are doing research on what drugs help them. Right? That's how it works. So, in 1995, I wrote the They Say You're Crazy. Uh, and then I, I, hardly anybody reviewed it, hardly anybody read it. And I had started writing plays when my second of my two kids went off to college. I went back to theater, which is my first love. And I wrote, the first play I wrote was called Call Me Crazy. And it's a comedy drama with music. And it was, it, it, it was done in New York, um, and, and it was well reviewed. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit of it at the end of, of my presentation. Um, and I did that because I wanted, I wanted more people to know what goes on. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. And then I started thinking, you know, if you picture um, the whole enterprise of psychiatric diagnosis as a sphere, and they say that it's, um, it's what the sphere is filled with science, but we know it's not. It's junk science. So let's take that sphere and let's remove all the junk science. That creates a void. What rushes into this vacuum? Every conceivable kind of bias, any subjective belief or attitude that your therapist has when you walk into that office. So I said, well, we need a book about this. So I edited a book called Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis. And it includes chapters um, by some fabulous writers. Wesley Prophet, who's a lawyer and psychologist, an African American, wrote a book about, uh, wrote a, an article about racism. Alicia Ali wrote about racism. Uh, Heather Bullock wrote about classism. Rochelle Josephowitz Siegel wrote about ageism. Um, Bob uh, Metcalf and I wrote about sexual orientation and homophobia. Um, and then there are individual chapters about just a sampling of particular diagnoses, like the brilliant <coughs> Jeffrey Poland. If you have not read anything by Jeffrey Poland, Google him, read everything you can find. He is a clinical psychologist, and he knows everything about the history of psychology and the philosophy. He, he's absolutely amazing. He wrote a chapter about called Bias and Schizophrenia. And you know how everybody, lots of people say, well, you know, I think too many things are diagnosed as mental illnesses, but schizophrenia is real, <laughs> right? That's the one they always come back to. And we know it's scientifically documented. We know that it's real. We know it's physiologically based. Some people say it's genes. Some people say it's chemistry. You just heard what Bob Whitaker had to say about it. Um, and of course, it's a wastebasket term. But his, his chapter about bias and schizophrenia is absolutely Take your breath away. Now, Jeff and I wrote a chapter in that book. We said, we have to address the question, why, when so much is wrong with psychiatric diagnosis, what keeps it going? What makes that whole enterprise so powerful? 
Now, you should have seen, we were sitting at my kitchen table trying to figure out how to write this chapter, and we were making a list of the various forces that keep it going and how they're intertwined. And we ended up hardly able even to talk about it, never mind write about it, because there are so many powerful forces and they're intertwined in such disturbing and powerful ways. But they include the lobby group called the American Psychiatric Association, which publishes the DSM, and they made $100 million on the current edition, the DSM-4. Um, they are not obligated to give that money to anybody who needs it. They can just keep it for themselves to increase the power and influence and territory of psychiatrists. Um, so it includes the APA. It certainly includes the drug companies. And you probably know this is my one sentence description of the history of the connection between the drug companies and, and the DSM folks. Um, it used to be that the drug companies would wait until some category went into the DSM, at which time they would say, we've got a drug for that. But now they come up with a category, and then they get it in the DSM. And so one, one time years ago, I got a phone call from a NPR uh, marketplace, you know, and they said, um, uh, we'd like you to comment on the fact that, was it Forest Labs? Um, uh, that just, just funded a study at Stanford. Now, you notice they never, they never give money to somebody at a community college or, or, or some, some place that's not known to have high admission standards. They, it's always Stanford or Harvard or something. Some researcher at Stanford, uh, we'd like you to comment on the fact that they just discovered that Celexa helps people who have compulsive shopping disorder. <laughs> and I thought this was a friend of mine putting me on. You know, well, here's what had happened, and this is the pattern. Um, when a drug gets approved by the FDA, it doesn't, that FDA doesn't say, okay, now you can go prescribe it. It's, it's approved to treat a particular condition. Now, when a drug company's patent on that drug is going to expire, if they can get the FDA to approve it for a new condition, or condition in quotes in this case, then they get an extension on the patent. Nobody else can make a generic form of it and make money from it. So like they're the only game in town. They have a monopoly on this drug as long as it's approved for another condition. So Celexa had been approved to treat depression, another wastebasket term that can be sadness, nostalgia, loneliness, helplessness, hopelessness, frustration, all kinds of things, right? But it had been approved to treat depression. Now, they're getting it approved to treat compulsive shopping disorder. So they made up that category, and then they try and get it in the DSM. All right, so uh, they're uh, back to the various forces that keep diagnosis going. So, we, so we've got the APA, we've got the, the drug companies, we've got the government. Um, written into the legislation, the mental health parity legislation, which of, um, of course I believe that anyone who's suffering should get the help that will be helpful to them and have it paid for. I lived in Canada for 19 years. It's wonderful. A single payer system is what we need. So I, this is not about saying that people shouldn't get help paid for if it's going to really be effective for them. But this is just about another set of systems that keeps the DSM very powerful. Medicare and Medicaid, the insurance companies, everybody says you've got to get a DSM label. The VA and the military mental health systems, they use the DSM. And if they used another classification system, the ICD, it's no better. It's no better. It overlaps enormously with the DSM. The only thing is the ICD is published by the World Health Organization. We're trying to find out what did they do with the profits from sale of the ICD. We haven't found out yet. But we know the AP, what the APA does with its profits. Um, what else keeps it going? Um, the, the fact that we live in, in a, a culture that's very technologically oriented and expects a clear, clean, quick fix. So let me get my label and then I'll know what drug to take or the doctor will know what drug to put me on. That's what a, a lot of people long for. It'd be nice if it happened and didn't hurt anybody, but that's another thing that keeps it going. And then the fact that, and I've forgotten the numbers, but um, people have done studies of how many, how many work hours 
the average American spends now compared to, say, 10 years ago. And what they found is that the average American who has a job uh, works many more hours than ever before. So people don't have time to heal in other ways. So a lot of people want to get a label and then get their pill. Um, there are other forces that keep it going, but those are some of them. And then, and then a lot of the, you know, the talk shows, the media, um, they'll throw around terms like bipolar, I'm bipolar, borderline, um, and, and whatever, whatever, Asperger's, the new one, everybody has Asperger's syndrome if you're not a, a total extrovert. Um, and, um, and, and so all of these labels are talked about as though they represent real entities and they are mental illnesses and we know what to do to fix them. All right. So um, when I, I, I was exhausted after <laughs> trying these things and seeing that it didn't matter, it didn't matter. I could write, I could speak, we could have this huge petition campaign. It really didn't matter. Nothing changed. In fact, the systems just got more powerful, as Bob was saying today, uh, earlier today. Um, and so when DSM-5, when the committees were appointed, I just felt tired. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to think about it. And then I started getting calls from people saying, what are you going to do about DSM-5? And I actually, I was kind of irritable, you know, and I would say, I don't know. What are you going to do? <laughs> and I thought, I'm not going to do anything because I don't have any more ideas. There's nothing I can think of to do. It didn't work. They're too powerful. They won. And then somebody at an AWP conference came up to me and she, if anybody was going to be able to do something, it would have, this, she would have, and she says to me, what are you going to do about DSM-5? I said, I don't know, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm much too busy with other things. So I went away and I thought about it. And then MIT Press asked me if I would, if I would be interested in writing a book about DSM-5. And I said, absolutely not. Why not? I said, because here's what I've learned over the years. What they do, the DSM people is they'll say publicly, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And if people object to something, then they may say, OK, we've changed our minds. Or they may not say anything. And the problem is that because they're not accountable to anybody, and this is a really crucial point that I hope you'll tell everybody you know that the whole enterprise of psychiatric diagnosis is totally unregulated. Nobody rides herd on them. The FDA doesn't do a very good job of riding herd on big pharma, but at least there's something supposedly going on. Nobody even pretends to regulate psychiatric diagnosis. <laughs> so I said, what they have done every time, and, and they'll do again, is they will publish a DSM-5 that will have things in it that we didn't know were going to be in it. So if I write a book and it goes to press, by the time the DSM-5 comes out, it will be out of date. My book will be out of date. So then I thought, oh, well, that's what the internet's for. So you can update as you find out things. So I went back to the Association for Women in Psychology, and they allowed me to create a committee on, on bias in psychiatric diagnosis. And a bunch of people joined. You can, you can be a man and be on it, too. And all we did, I said, I, you know, nobody has time, nobody has any funding for this, so let's just do what we can. So what we wrote two and three page papers and put them on that section of the AWP website. The website is awpsych, A-W-P-S-Y-C-H dot org. And if you go there, you'll see on the home page a little thing you can click called Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis. And it was just papers. Leonor Tiefer wrote one about, about women and sexuality. Uh, people wrote some about obesity and mental illness. You know, they want to call that a mental illness. Then they'll, then they'll put you on psych drugs for it, which, of course, <laughs> make you gain weight. Um, so we wrote, we wrote a bunch of short papers. I understand that, that Professor Beverly Green and some other people assign these in their courses. So, so that's great. So that information's there. Um, it was just whatever anybody wanted to write about. It's, it's there. And then David Oakes from Mind Freedom International and Jim Gottstein from Psych Rights had this fabulous idea that because, now I don't know if this actually happened, but the APA was scheduled to vote to send the DSM-5 to press 
at its conference this past May, <coughs> May 5th, right? And so uh, you probably have heard about they, they organized a protest called 5-5, May 5th, against DSM-5 in, in Philadelphia at the APA convention. So I was thinking, well, leading up to that convention, here's what we need. I had said in my 1995 book, I had said in the last chapter, I'm afraid the only thing that's going to stop these people is lawsuits. And I think that's true. I still think that's true. I'd been trying to find a lawyer ever since then who would take it on. Jim Gottstein does great work, but he hasn't taken on one about psych diagnosis. And goodness knows there's no money to pay him, and he's already you know, pay, spent all his money doing, doing the cases about the drugs and about forced treatment, and, and he's, he's fabulous and brave, but one human being can only do so much. So if you know of a lawyer who might take on a case about diagnosis specifically, um, here's why I think it matters, two, two things. One is that you can complain and worry about the harmful effects of drugs and about forced treatment, and those are extremely important. But remember that if they don't diagnose you, they can't do any of those other bad things to you. They can't sexually assault their patients if they don't diagnose them and get them into therapy so that they can assault. So, so the first cause of all the harm that ever happens in the mental health system is getting one of those labels. That's one reason it matters. Another reason it matters is the array of kinds of harm is staggering. Over the years, every time I thought that I'd heard every kind of harm, and now I could neatly categorize them, I could say, uh, you, can, you can lose your job or fail to get a job. You can lose custody of your children because of having virtually any label from the DSM. You can lose, lose the right to make decisions about your medical and legal affairs. Um, I, and you can lose your health insurance. Well, now, thanks to, I know, I know Obamacare has some problems, but at least you don't, you don't get refused insurance because you have a pre-existing condition. Um, but up until then, uh, you can, or you can have skyrocketing premiums just from being diagnosed with adjustment disorder. Sounds so harmless, but it isn't. It's dangerous. So, um, every time I'd heard, I thought I'd heard of a kind of harm, of every kind of harm, I heard of another one. Uh, and over the decades, I have been hearing stories about people whose lives have been destroyed because it all started with getting one of these labels. So, in the lead up to the 5-5 against DSM-5 protest, I thought, I wish we could get a lawsuit filed. Forget about class action suits. My daughter's a lawyer. Um, by the time it takes years to get a class defined, then you take it to court, and then they'll say, oh, that's not a legitimate class, and then you have to start all over again. The, the, you know, the Supreme Court did that with the Walmart case. Women were being so obviously systematically discriminated against. I mean, it was just blatant, and the Supreme Court declared that, well, women were not a legitimate class for this. Anyway, um, so forget about class action suits. I was looking for, for some lawyer to take on a lawsuit by one person who'd been harmed by diagnosis. And sure, it's good to sue the person who gave you the label, but I wanted to go to the first cause, the, the APA and the DSM. Why? Because, you know, if, if General Motors makes a car and they know it's dangerous, they know it can cause harm, they may or may not tell the, the dealers around the country. And the dealership owners may or may not tell the sales force on the floor selling you your car. Now, if your car blows out a tire and somebody's injured, you can sue the person who sold you for not telling you, but you need to go to the top. Somebody's got to hold accountable the people at the top who know there's harm. How do I know they know there's harm? Because since I joined those two DSM-4 committees ever since then in 1988, I've been sending them reports of harm. And what do they do? They say publicly, this doesn't cause any harm and they certainly don't do anything to fix it. So I was looking for a lawyer, couldn't find one. I, ca I called Jim Gottstein, which I do periodically. Jim, do you have any time to take on a case? And he said, you know, here's what I think is the way to go. 
He said the American Psychiatric Association has a set of ethical standards and all its members are supposed to follow those ethical standards. And he said, I think that maybe the way to go is filing complaints with the APA. So I sent out a call. I didn't want to tip our hand. I sent out a call for, I said, I've, I've had this um, website called, excuse me, psychdiagnosis.net for years. Um, now we don't know how to update it, technology, so we're creating a new one, and, and it's psychdiagnosis.weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com. I'll, I'll give it again later. Um, and we want to put some more recent stories of harm. We've got 53 stories of harm on the old one. We want some more recent stories of harm. Because in the APA procedures, they say if you want to file a complaint, there has to have been harm in the last 10 years. So I started getting stories of harm. And I would say to people, I want you to write it up in two pages or less. And I want you to say the following things. Say, here's what was happening to me when I got the label or labels and this is what they labeled mental illness. Say what label or labels you got. Uh, make sure you can document that they were from the DSM, not, not the ICD or somewhere else. Um, and, um, and say what kinds of harm you suffered, financial or non-financial. So I got these stories. And each time somebody would write to me, I would say, is it okay to put it on the new website with or without your name? Yes. And then, if, the, if, it was, if it was really clear what the sequence had been and that we could say, yes, the harm started with getting the label and they suffered clear harm, then I would ask each person, are you interested in possibly filing a complaint against the people who caused the harm, the first cause? So I ended up with eight people and nine complaints were filed. And we first filed them in late April. And let me tell you briefly what the complaints consist of. There are five sections. And they, about 90, 95% of the content is identical in, in all the cases. Seven of the people, and by the way, it was only women who came forward. Seven of the women had each been harmed themselves. The eighth woman had a close family member who had actually died because of this. And then I filed as an interested party. Jeffrey Wilson, who's an attorney in Canada, had suggested that to me. As an interested party who'd seen so much harm, who had tried to do something about it, seen that they don't do anything about it. Um, here's how all five of the complaints look. Section one says, here's, here's why we're filing, and, um, and names the respondents. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Like, who in the APA is this complaint against. Section two is called My Story. So you can imagine what that looked like for the people who'd been harmed or had a loved one harmed. And then, and then I described having heard these stories of harm for, for decades and seen that they don't do anything about it. Section three is the longest section. The, the complaints are now about 60 pages long each. And they're almost identical to each other. Section three, in that section, we say, what was known about the lack of science behind psychiatric diagnosis, behind the DSM? Like, what did they know and when did they know it? And the initial complaints, the ones that were filed in April, were filed against three people, uh, the three editors of dsm four and then the dsm four tr the, the current edition. OK, Alan Francis, Harold Pincus, and Michael first. It's filed against them. My complaint, I thought, you know, I think I'm going to make mine a little different. I had so many direct interactions with Alan Francis, who was the top guy. I talked to him on the phone. We had letters that went back and forth. So I'm going to make mine a little different, and I'm just going to file mine against him. All right, so then section three. So section three is what did they know and when did they know it about the lack of science in the DSM and about the, um, the fact that getting a label does not improve outcome. Now that's it's like what Bob was talking about. It's an exact parallel with what Bob was talking about. Everybody thinks get your label and you'll get better. They will heal you. It actually doesn't improve outcome. And what did they know and when did they know it about the kinds of harm that can be caused? So we, then, we, then uh, section four is actions that we were requesting. 
And some of the actions we all requested. So for example, we said within six months of the filing of this complaint, we'd like the American Psychiatric Association to convene its own public hearing about harm from diagnosis. Nobody's ever done that. I tried years ago to get congressional hearings about it. Of course, that went nowhere. But the APA should do this. You know, drug companies are at least in theory required to gather evidence of harm from their products. And remember, the DSM is a product, right? We're talking about interstate commerce. This is a federal issue. They sell this book and make a lot of money from it and by falsely advertising it. And then they're not held accountable for any of the consequences that are harmful. So section four, so we asked for them to have, uh, to have a public hearing. Um, each of the other uh, eight complainants asked um, for them to be sent a letter listing whatever label or labels they'd been given or their loved one and saying, we want a letter from you saying there is no scientific evidence supporting the claim that these are real entities. And then I'm going to put that in my file, wherever I have a file. Or I might go to a lawyer and ask my lawyer, look, here's this letter. I want you to get my label or labels removed from my file. Um, there are people who had lost money because they, they had to drop out of school and they lost scholarship money or they had to leave their jobs and go on SSI. Um, they were asking for money. I said, just ask for whatever would put your life back where it was before this happened to you. Now, I warned them. I said, the most likely outcome of these complaints being filed will be nothing. Because they don't have to do anything. And they will have high paid lawyers that will find ways to make sure that they do nothing in response to these complaints. I said, just be aware of that from the beginning. But I said, but we're going to ask for everything that really would put your life back where it was before. And then section five was of a couple of procedural requests we all made. One was we said that um, because um, uh, that, we, oh, that we'd, like, we'd like to have the right to see whatever the respondents sent um, after they were shown the complaints, whatever, whatever their replies were, and we'd like to have the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses. Okay, these go out the last weekend of April. I had tried to get some media person interested. I have a media list of about 115 people, all of whom have, have called to interview me about related subjects in the past. So it's not like just random media people. Nobody was interested in doing a story on this groundbreaking action of filing these complaints. So I had written something for the Washington Post six months before, and that editor agreed to let me write about it. So on April 29th, an article was published, an op-ed piece, um, about the DSM doing more harm than good. And toward the end, um, I talked about the complaints being filed. I said, usually people whose lives have been ruined because of getting a label don't have the emotional energy, the time, the self-confidence, the, the money to, to, to do anything, to file, certainly to file lawsuits, but even to do this. And most haven't even known that it could be done. But all that's changing because this weekend, nine complaints are being filed. Now, within the four days, first, first it went up online, and then it was published in print two days later. In the first four days after it went up, more than 400 comments were posted. And to my amazement, and this things really are starting to change in terms of people's awareness of the problems, even though what keeps it going is so powerful. But things are starting to change from the standpoint of people's awareness because something like 95% of those comments were very positive. But almost nobody mentioned the complaints. And I had thought, well, I'll hear from other people saying, how do I file one? I heard from almost nobody, which is very interesting. I don't know. Maybe people didn't read to the end of, I don't, I don't know. Um, and um, so that article came out. Now, we filed the complaints. We're waiting to hear. Every one of us in our cover letter said, please notify me that you received this complaint, and please let me know what will be, bless you, what will be the next steps. Because if you go online and you look at their procedures for complaints, 
it doesn't really say very much about what happens. It says, well, you file a complaint, and then it'll go to a district branch, and you know, then they'll decide what to do. That's pretty much what it amounts to. So we wanted to know what will the next steps be, and when will they be taken? We didn't hear anything. After weeks, I write to Linda Hughes, who's in their office at the APA. I think she's an administrator. And I say, can you tell me, did you get my complaint? And she says, yes, Alan Francis is no longer a member of the APA. Now, they won't tell me when he left or why. They say, well, it was years before. So apparently it wasn't because we filed a complaint. If, if somebody files a complaint against you, by the way, you can just leave and then the APA can't do anything because it's a voluntary organization. But anyway, um, so, so my complaint was completely useless. And the other eight people, well, Alan Francis was one of the three people they had filed against. So first I felt really sad and like I'd been kicked in the stomach. And then I was walking to Starbucks the next morning and I suddenly thought, okay, who else? I'm gonna have to refile mine. Who else is responsible? And then it was like the sun came out. I thought, oh boy, an awful lot of people are responsible and they haven't been named as respondents. So I wrote to the other eight complainants and I said, please write to Linda Hughes if you want to and say, don't act anymore on my complaint because I'm going to file an amended complaint. And then I spent the next two or three months working on those and those were filed in late June, early July. And let me tell you what, what was in those. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time. Um, okay, what was in those? Um, first of all, all of us named a huge number of people as respondents. We named not only the two DSM-4 editors who are still members of the APA, but also we named everyone who is a member of the APA who has been a president of the APA or a member of their board of trustees from 1988 to the present. Why 1988? Because that's when the DSM-4 task force was first appointed. And so any one of those people having legal responsibility for what their association does knew or ought to have known. If they didn't know, they should have found out. Because the DSM is the, it's the most public face. It's the, the biggest thing the APA does, right? And certainly the most financially profitable. They knew or ought to have known that it wasn't scientific, that it didn't help outcome, and that it caused harm and every one of them should have made some effort to gather evidence of the harm and use some of that hundred million dollars to redress some of the harm and not a single one did it. We also named as a respondent the APA itself as an entity. Why? Because if you look at the DSM, who's the publisher? The APA. Where does all the money go? from the people who buy the DSM, and you know it has all these associated products, the case book, the source book, DVDs, etc. I always think it's like when another Star Wars comes out and McDonald's sells all the toys, you know, associated with it. So they make a fortune from the DSM and these associated products. So we filed against them and we said in these new complaints, we said, uh, in that every member of the APA is expected to follow these ethical standards, surely the APA as an entity is also expected to follow those standards, and they haven't, right? So that's who we filed against. And also, depending on what your label or labels were, we looked up, so who were the heads of that work group within the DSM-4 and 4TR that, that was in charge of your label or labels? So we named them as respondents. We also did some other new things in the, in the amended complaints. One was that um, one of the other complainants had, had pursued Linda Hughes and she had gotten the letter saying, well, Alan Francis isn't a member anymore. But also they had said to her um, that uh, uh, we're going to figure out uh, which district branch to send it to. And since Dr. Pincus and Dr. First both belong to this New York State branch, um, that's probably where we'll send it. Okay, so we thought about that. Now, in the amended complaints, it says two things. One is, these are matters of national and even international significance. And the respondents live all over the U.S. and probably some in Canada. 
And so you need to deal with these complaints at the national level. We also said since the APA itself is being named as a respondent, we're requesting that you bring in external, objective people to deal with these complaints. All right, now let me tell you, here's where I have to refer to my notes because I want to I wanna make sure not to, re, uh, to leave anything out. Okay, so, so first what happens, we file in late June, early July, and, and so what do you think happens first? It's so predictable. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. We just don't hear from them, right? So after some weeks, I start writing Linda Hughes again, and then I'm told, well, she's away. So Eurisha Mosley says, uh, you know, Linda's away. So I say, well, will you please let each of us know, have you received our complaints? Oh, and one of the complainants, one of the complainants said, you know, we emailed the complaints, the initial complaints. She said, I think we should also send them in hard copy and I said, yes, return receipt requested, because we need to be able to prove that they got them. Um, she said, because can you imagine 60 page complaints, nine of them, just imagine the drama of them stacked up on somebody's desk there. You know, it's serious, right? So everybody sa had sent them in hard copy too. So I, so I said to Eurisha, please confirm that you got my complaint, and please let me know, let me know what the next steps will be. Well, so weeks, weeks go by. Finally, Linda Hughes is back. And, and I, get, uh, I get the following uh, information. And by the way, I'm suspecting all the time, of course, that um, they're, they're going to their lawyers. You know, they must have lawyers that they pay a fortune to. So I know they're checking all this out with their lawyers. And so Linda Hughes writes and she says, uh, you know, uh, this is going to take us a while. Nobody's ever done this before. So I write back and say, yes, this is groundbreaking. That's right. Nobody's ever tried to hold accountable the people who are responsible for the harm. Oh, and I want to just stop here to say something because this is really important. Um, some of the people who had said they were going to file complaints, we got part way into it and you know first they have to they have to determine that their labels came from the DSM and I tell them how to how to do that. But then they have to write their story before we can proceed. And some of them dropped out because it was too painful to write the story. It was bad enough to go through it without reliving it by writing the story. Of the people who stayed in and filed complaints, many of them wrote, I, I'm sorry I haven't gotten back to you in answer to your questions about the story. It's so painful. But then they would write, but you know, for the first time in all these years I'm feeling better because I'm putting on paper what they did to me and what happened to my life because of it. And I know they might not do anything about it, but at last I'm trying to hold them accountable. And so people have found this very empowering and strengthening. And also there's something to be said. I mean, they, everyone was traumatized by the system. Well, by its nature, trauma is inarticulable and it's fragmenting. So part of the delay in putting together their stories was they'd do a piece of it and then they'd do another piece and then sometimes I could say, well, so then that followed from that. And so it was, it was giving form to something that had just hit them and fragmented them and that they couldn't even put words to in all these years. So it's getting it all together and then saying, you are responsible, you need to do something, whether or not they ever do. And then if they want to file a lawsuit, then it's all there anyway. So, all right, so, they, so, uh, so I asked them, so when, when are you gonna, when are you gonna do, let us know what are the next steps? And they said, well, uh, we're not sure uh, because we really have to have a, a, an ethics committee meeting and I wrote and said, and when will that be and who's on the committee? Because Linda Hughes and Eurisha Mosley, I think, are like secretaries or administrators. They're not, they're not members of the APA. And uh, they won't tell us who the ethics committee consists of. Uh, then um, I got a letter from their general counsel, who is a woman. And she says, well, we can't hear these, these complaints at the national level because that's not our procedure and we've never done it before and she said I'm sure you can understand that in order to be fair and just 
to everyone. We have to use the same procedures for everyone. So I wrote back to her, and we have a little listserv for the, the complainants, I copied to them. I wrote back to her and I said, well, I understand that your intention is to be fair and just, but I said, as a lawyer, I know you'll appreciate that historically, things come up. As Linda Hughes has said, this is a groundbreaking mm -hmm. initiative. And I said, and as a lawyer, I know you'll appreciate that historically, new things come up. And then the systems that are empowered to deal with them have to figure out what do we do now? And I said, I really hope that the APA Ethics Committee will consider coming up with some new procedures because after all, if that were never done, then in this country, slavery would still be legal and you and I wouldn't be allowed to vote. Now, she didn't write back. In fact, she told me in her letter that this was going to be her last word on the subject, <laughs> okay? Right, we well, you know you have all the power, lady. All right. Um, so, also, nobody has responded to the request that they bring in outsiders um, to hear the complaints. They finally told us that the Ethics Committee, who are nameless, will meet in early September, but they wouldn't say when. Now, back in early August, it had been over a month since the complaints were filed, and I wrote and I said, now I understand you're having a meeting of the Ethics Committee in September sometime. I said, given the amount of suffering that the complainants have been through for many years, and given the, the handiness of technology, I said, I'm wondering, is there some reason that you can't organize a teleconference of the Ethics Committee before, well before the meeting that you're already planning to have in, in September anyway? And so that was ignored. No, we're just, we're meeting in, in September. Also, they did something that, you know, you find out how terrifying these systems are when you actually get into them. Um, in our complaints, every one of us in section one cited the APA's description, uh, its published description of its procedures for complaints, for filing and handling complaints. And it was published in 2010 or 2011. We cited it. It's, you know, I wrote the complaints. It's footnoted like crazy. I do that, right? I wanted to make sure they didn't say, oh, she's just making this claim for any of the complainants. So that document is footnoted right in the first section of the complaints. Well, we all get a letter from Linda Hughes. And enclosed with the letter, is a printout of those procedures. And the letter to each one of us says, uh, clearly you're not familiar with the current edition of our procedures. And we know that because you don't seem to understand. These are not legal proceedings. And therefore, you don't get to cross-examine witnesses. If we decide to proceed with your complaint, then the committee might decide to call you as a witness. So you file a complaint, and this is true, this is how they operate. You file a complaint, and then if they, if they decide to proceed, it's them against the respondents that you've named, and then they call you as a witness. But they can, they can ask for anything else they want, and they can also ignore anything they want. And, and they said, and therefore, you know, it's not like a legal case where you're sent everything that they respond. And so I thought, okay, reading between the lines, I think here's what's happening. They're saying, um, they're trying to find a way to just dismiss the complaints out of hand by saying these complaints were filed with the complainants not understanding the nature of our complaint process because they asked us to do things that we don't do. So. I wrote back and I asked each of the respondents to consider writing back and not all of them have, and I'm not sure why, but about five of, or six of the nine of us have, um, wrote back to Linda Hughes and said the following, and to the lawyer, to the general counsel, and said the following. Um, first of all, in section one of the complaint, we cited the very document that you sent to us. So yes, we were aware of it. We had read it thoroughly. Secondly, in case you are considering 
trying to dismiss each complaint totally on the grounds that you can't do everything that we're asking, please don't do that. We request hereby that you proceed with anything in any of the complaints that you choose to deal with, that you decide are within what you are able to do. So that's where things are now. Um, as far They may be meeting this week. We, didn't, we don't know. We, we're just going to wait to hear. And if I don't hear in a week or so, then I'll, I'll say early September has passed. Now, now what's going to happen? Um, I want to talk about <clears throat> one other kind of thing. Um, have, have any of you heard about the open letter that was actually a petition yeah, um, to, the, to the DSM-5 people? Um, a, a bit of, of history. Um, Robert Spitzer, top editor of DSM-3 and 3R, and Alan Francis, top editor of DSM-4, started in 2009 um, writing scathing attacks on the DSM-5 people. <laughs> Now, they're not involved in DSM-5, and who knows what their motives are? I don't know. It was really interesting to read what they were attacking the DSM-5 people for. They were attacking them because what they're doing isn't scientific, and because what they're doing is going to cause harm. Did they cite any of us, certainly not just me, any of us, my, my first book and the second book, are both, both have long bibliographies of other people who've critiqued the DSM, various editions. Did they cite any of, of these people? No. No. They just suddenly realized that not what they did, but what the DSM-5 people were going to do was uh, plagued by all the problems we've been writing about for over a quarter of a century. Um, periodically and selectively, Alan Francis would talk about, let's see, bipolar disorder in children, ADHD, and what's the third one? Maybe it was Asperger's. Autism. Autism, thank you, thank you. And he would say, you know, it's, it's been, oh, those have been overdiagnosed since our edition came out. He didn't say that they should have done something to keep that from happening. If they had said the truth in DSM-4 and said, there is no evidence that bipolar disorder is a real entity or uh, autism, I mean, of course kids suffer, of course adults suffer. I'm not questioning whether there are varieties of suffering, but it's one thing, I've compared them to the constellations. You know, you look up in the sky and you see millions of stars, and then you choose to connect the dots you say, that's Orion, and that's the Big Dipper. Well, of course, there's an infinite number of ways you could connect these. And if you look at everybody given the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, they don't look exactly alike, right? Because you can have six of the nine or four of the eight or, or whatever, and it's up to your therapist to decide which of the criteria you meet. So in the Washington Post article, I wrote um, about one case. It was a woman who was married, had a young child who was in a licensed daycare. Um, she, the, the woman had a, a full-time job that she loved, and all night, every night, she was caring for her grandmother, whom she adored and who was terminally ill. She was totally sleep deprived. One day, but she's managing, one day she finds out that when she drops her child off at this licensed daycare, they're taking her child and some other kids and shipping them off to an unlicensed daycare center. Well, like, where's she going to find the time and energy to check out where they're sending her kid to look for another place? Her heart starts pounding. She thinks maybe she's having a heart attack. She goes to the nearest ER, and within, this won't surprise you, within a few minutes, what do you think happens? She gets diagnosed with bipolar disorder because she's talking really fast and, she, and, she ha and, and her, her thoughts are racing and because she's all wound up, oh, that's mania, right? And gets diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, committed against her will. Put on Seroquel for six weeks and before she got off. She now, she still, three years later, has blepharitis, inflammation in her eyes. And if she gets an infection, she could go blind. Um, somebody I know very well has had that happen to them. 
uh, and she's written about it publicly. Uh, and, and the social worker comes in and says, dear, since you have bipolar disorder, you're really not going to be able to continue holding down the job you have. You need to go on SSI. Her marriage fell apart because although her husband didn't believe that she had a mental illness, and rightly so, she was so devastated by this whole sequence of events that the marriage fell apart. He couldn't handle it anymore. Okay, so, um, so here, Alan Francis and Robert Spitzer are saying uh, the DSM-5 people are wrong, and I'm thinking, yeah, but the DSM-4 is being used every day right now, and DSM-5 isn't even coming out until uh, the spring of 2013. Who's watching out for the people who are being harmed today and who have been harmed up till now by the current edition? Because Alan Francis was very effective in taking the focus off <coughs> the harm that he had done, and people think he's a great hero. So Alan Francis, who is more than any other individual in the history of the world responding for, uh, responsible for more millions of people being diagnosed and having their lives destroyed is considered a hero. And guess what? Right around the time the DSM-5 comes out, he's publishing a book called Saving Normal. Alan Francis Saving Normal? It, it's, it, it, you would think George Orwell wrote this story if you didn't know the truth. Um, furthermore, I don't know if there's any cause-effect relationship here temporally, but right within a week or two after the complaints were filed, so, you know, Alan Francis was named in them, and he probably still knows people in the APA, um, so maybe it was related to that, maybe not. He gave a, a major public talk at Hart House at the University of Toronto and it's on video. And his whole talk looks like a defense against the complaint that was filed against him. Now, he knew he wasn't subject to the complaint process, but, but he's really covering his tracks. And what he does in that video is he says, all these children were diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and all these people with autism and with ADHD. And he says, we didn't do that. You know who did that? The drug companies made that happen. Well, who did he appoint to all his work groups? The vast majority of the members of the DSM-4 and 4TR work groups got huge amounts of drug money for research and or for going around promoting the drugs. Okay, so watch out for Alan Francis. Also watch out for the Scientologists who have billions of dollars from Tom Cruise and people like that. And they have something called the CCHR, which sounds lovely. I thought it was before I found out what it was. Citizens Commission on Human Rights. Oh, doesn't that just get to you? Good for them, right? Except what they do is they pr produce these very slick videos and films that, are, that have a lot of truth in them about harm in the mental health system uh, and some lies. Um, I was just telling some people before we started this morning that um, uh, they got me to be uh, interviewed for one of their films by lying to me and telling me they had nothing to do with Scientology or the CCHR. They called Bob Whitaker after I agreed to be in their film, not knowing who they were. I even asked them. I said, are you connected with Scientology or the CCHR? No, absolutely not. Then they called Bob Whitaker, who had refused to be in the film, because he'd heard something about Scientology at that point, but not, not a lot. And, and he thought maybe they were kind of, so he had said no. And then they called him and said, well, Paula Kaplan's going to do it. And Bob and I are friends and colleagues. And he thought, well, Paula must know. And so if she's going to, so he agreed to be in it. Disastrous consequences came to him because of it. He sent me the final film. They didn't. And what they had done, they took something I said out of context, and it said, Harvard University, Paula Kaplan, Harvard University. And it, said, it just shows me saying this, there is no such thing as mental illness. All right. Well, I was devastated when I saw this, because I was teaching at Harvard at the time. I go to class, and I say to my students, 
What would you say if somebody said to you, Paula Kaplan says there's no such thing as mental illness? And they rolled their eyes and they said, we would say, she says, of course people suffer. And of course they deserve help. But where you draw the line and start calling something a mental illness and acting like it's a real entity and these symptoms always go together, that's, that's totally subjective. And I said, right. Now, I just imagined people who had been diagnosed and who are suffering, and they were glad to be diagnosed because they took that as a way of saying something, somebody saying to them, yes, we believe you're suffering. I just imagine them watching this and them thinking, oh, somebody at Harvard says there's no such thing as mental, how, how hurtful is that? So I wrote to the Scientologist and I said, first of all, you fraudulently got me in your film. And secondly, you took what I said out of context in a very damaging way. Get me out of your film and recall all copies of it. And they said, well, if, we'll try if you sign an agreement never to say anything negative publicly or privately about Scientology. I said, you want me to sign away my First Amendment rights? I said, critical thinking is what I do. <laughs> and, and you people are dangerous. They had also. Uh, mischaracterized, not misquoted, but mischaracterized and misapplied something I had said in, a, in an amicus brief to, in a Supreme Court case, in a, in a criminal case. And Justice Souter obviously didn't know who the CCHR was and obviously did not have his clerks find out the truth about what they were saying. And he cited it in his decision that was the majority decision with disastrous consequences for people who are suffering, who are troubled, and who get charged with a crime.